So, good afternoon, everybody. I, um, I will continue today. I actually just started a little bit on the chapter about world population change over time. I just want to give you a couple of announcements here. We have a quiz today, and the quiz, as you know, it's supposed to be up from 4.30 today until noon tomorrow, but I had a problem in Canvas. So it will be up a little later than that. As soon as it is available on Canvas, I'm gonna send an email to everybody. And if I'm one hour late to post it from 4.30, then you're gonna have an extra one hour to finish it. So I will do the deadline in accordance to how late I am to post it. The, in previous semesters, the teaching evaluation, you might know, it was done through this website here, pica.tamu.edu. But then the university is changing the system, and the system is not ready yet. What I have told you is that I don't know if this new system will have the opportunity to have this early feedback. Early feedback is pretty much you just fill out this questionnaire with your opinion about the course and about me. And this used to be done in the middle of the semester and then one at the end of the semester. I don't know if the system will allow the early feedback. If it does not allow, then we're going to have just an end of the term evaluation. And then if at least 90% of the students answer this one, they will get, you get 4% bonus points because my deal was to give 4% in total. So if it doesn't exist anymore, the early feedback, instead of being two, two, it's gonna be four. But I will confirm this as I know more about the system. So everything is changing to Canvas, from eCampus, and then to this new system from PICA. Just remember that one week from now, on Tuesday, it's our new, it, sorry, it's our first exam. Even if we don't change, uh, finish chapter 13, we will have the exam on September 15th on Tuesday. And this day we don't have face-to-face -face class. And you can just take the exam from your computer from anywhere, just connect it to the internet. And the exam will be open on Tuesday as scheduled from 1 to 8 p.m., okay, on the day of the exam. Is that clear? Um, so quiz four is gonna be a little late, but we post it today. First exam one week from now, and this teaching evaluation I still have to, to get to know about the new system. And um, answer the quizzes. A lot of people are not answering the quizzes. And these are part of the regular grades. So it's important little by little that you answer, you are summing up grade, uh, points for your final grade. And right now we have here in the classroom, five people plus 31 attending on Zoom. It's um, 36 people of a class of 71 people. So there are a lot of people not attending. No, 33, so it's increasing a little bit. So like around 40 people in total attending per day. And if you don't attend the class and I ask specific questions that were just mentioned in that classroom, so there is nothing we can do about it. Okay, so just, if you cannot attend, if any of your friends cannot attend in person, just watch the lecture on YouTube. And you can tell your friends that if you have contact with anyone in the classroom. Um, so I will start now the lecture on world population change over time. The idea here is to give a summary of major demographic changes that are happening in the world. So five contemporary aspects of importance to demography. And also talk a little bit about like what is demographic transition and demographic transition is the main theoretical model that tries to explain uh, how much and, and how mortality and fertility declined um, throughout the, the human history. And this 
all these slides here on global population trends, that's from another textbook. And it's kind of also included in the topic that we discussed on in the first, in the first uh, two days of classes, so I will not talk about them in detail. Someone asked, what is the best way to prepare for the exam? I suggest you reading the textbook and um, reading the slides. That's how I used to say to my students in the past. And my students in the past who did take, get the best grades in my exams, they would also take notes while I was talking. Because by taking notes, you kind of like it's a way to internalize the knowledge. So read the textbook, read the slides, and now you have the advantage of also watching the lecture, any specific topic that's not clear for you, you can just go there on YouTube and watch those specific minutes that were not clear for you. And if you have even further questions, we can have office hours and office hours is really flexible this semester. Just send me an email when we set up an office hour to answer specific questions you might have. Cool. So the five main topics that we discuss here under the five contemporary aspects of importance of demography are the greatest demographic change in human history was verified in these last centuries, decades. So the population increased a lot in size. There were also spectacular gains in life expectancy. In other words, mortality declined a lot. And following the, the decline in mortality, fertility also declined a lot. And in some countries, fertility declined so much that women on beverage are having less than 2.1 children throughout their reproductive years between the ages of 15 and 49. By having less than 2.1 children, that means that they are not replacing themselves and their partners. Why 2.1, why not two is considered the below replacement level. We put like 0.1 because a lot of these people who will be born from this woman, they will die before they finish, that they uh, reach reproductive ages. So, and also because usually you have more boys being born than girls. So the Fertility below the replacement level is considered 2.1 with the idea that women, they have to have a little more than one girl on average in a specific society. So that girl will replace the woman in order to have kids into the future. And that daughter will survive at least until the age of 49. Some of these daughters will not reach the age of 49. That's why you have to have this um, you have at least it's little more than 2.1 children per woman. So whenever someone says, oh, a specific country reached fertility below replacement level is because the total fertility rate is below 2.1 children per woman on average. Uh, the, the, there is a lot of like variation sex ratios at birth. You already talked a little bit about this. A lot of unbalanced sex ratio at birth. Some countries reaching really, really high levels of sex ratio at birth because of the preference for baby boys. So we, there are countries that reach even 120 boys being born in a specific year for every 100 girls. So really high sex ratios at birth. And because people are living longer, mortality declines, and you have fewer children, fertility declines, you start to have in the countries a higher proportion of people in older ages. So a lot of countries, mostly developed countries, are experiencing population aging in this uh, recent uh, decades and recent years. So just to show you here, this is the population in the world, the historic and projected population growth from around 1 million years ago and how it increased over time. It took many years to reach 1 billion back in 1800. And then 
it took another 130 years to add another billion people. And then it took only 30 years to add another billion people to the world population. 14 years for another billion, 13 years for another billion, 12, and then 12 again. And then for, um, uh, the population keeps increasing, but now in a slower pace. So you know, uh, the projection is that we will add another billion by after 13 years, not 12 as we had before. But it's just to give an idea that in these more recent years, we took around 12, 13 years to add another billion people to the world because of high fertility and because mortality declined a lot. But it took all these thousands of years here to reach one billion people back in 1800. And exactly after the industrial revolution, when we start being more efficient in production, where we start to have better um, health habits and mortality starts to decline, mostly mortality among um, infants, among babies below, uh, below the age of one, then you start to see an increase, a huge increase in population, in population size. And if we just use, just look at these specific years, more recent years here, between 1950 and the projections up to 2050, we see that the overall population is increasing from a little below uh, 3 billion back in 1950 to around 9.3 billion expected by 2050. But what we see now is a different geographical, geographic composition of where people are located. In previous decades, a lot of these people, even thinking about totals, they were located in more developed countries and in other less developed countries besides Africa, China, and India. But what happens is that in more recent years, mortality starts to decline, not only in more developed countries, but also in less developed countries including in Africa, including in China, including in India. So mortality declines, people start to live longer, and then you start to see an increase in population size. But these countries here, less developed countries, they also experience still high levels of fertility. So they do experience a decline in mortality, but their fertility is still at high levels. So their overall population size starts to increase much faster than in more developed countries because more developed countries experience decline in mortality but also decline in fertility. Patrick? So given that China has their one child policy which is meant to uh, curb the population growth, how, is, how, is, how do they expect it to uh, go as high as it is on that list? So the question is, China had the one child policy, how is still with the one child policy, how is it it's still going up on the list here? So even, even with the one child policy, if you look at the overall trends of total fertility uh, rates in China, they kind of like were around two children per woman. Even with the one child policy, women were still having on average two children, right? With two children, you are pretty much replacing the size of your population, but also you are, uh, but your population is living longer because mortality is also declining. But what you see is that after the one child policy was implemented back in 1979, and it ended around uh, 2015, you see that after here, the width of this area here doesn't increase anymore because the Chinese population is kind of like stable in size. 
right? So the one child policy worked more over here. And even working over here, the overall population increased a little bit or increased a lot because you see the width of this area here, it's narrower than this one here because still, even with the one child policy, on average, women were having two children and people were living longer because of mortality declines, right? So whenever we're talking about the one child policy, yeah, it had influence to uh, control fertility in China, but it did not keep the average at one, right? And a lot of um, researchers that do try to analyze the, the trends in fertility in China, they also point that the decline in fertility in China was not only attributed to the one child policy, but also because economic development in China. Because we start to see urbanization, we start to see economic development also being harder to have a, a bigger family, to sustain a bigger family, that economic development also make people have less children, right? So, but I think the short answer to your question is even with the one child policy, on average, women, they had on average two children, a little above than that. It dropped a lot, but it didn't reach levels much below than that. And because of improvements in health, people were living longer, then you see an increase in the Chinese population. But what you see even further is these changes in Africa and India. For example, 1970, see the size of the overall population in the African continent, this width here, really, really narrow and expected to be much wider by 2050. The same thing in India. The Indian, the Indian population also expected to grow and the Indian population is expected to be higher than the Chinese population this next year. Is that clear? Cool? Another thing that happened over the past uh, two centuries, especially after the end of World War II, uh, was a uh, huge decline in mortality rates in the world. And this is considered the most important thing in human history. It's a consequence and cause of how a new way that we view the world, really basic health measures that we start to take, they start to increase the chances of children reaching at least one year of age. So infant mortality rate declined a lot. The mortality rate of those reaching, not reaching, up to one year of age. And these transitions have been really transformative because as you have children surviving and reaching older ages, you will start to see a change in the age composition of the countries. We talk about the age composition that we can see with the, the population pyramids, how they were called before, or with the age sex structure. And we see that now with these children reaching labor ages, you start to see more people being able to work and fewer proportions of people in, in younger ages. So that changes overall and basic measures of in hospitals, um, washing scissors before cutting the umbilical cord washing your hands before taking a meal. All these basic hygiene measures, they improved a lot the chances of children surviving. Um, sewer system, treated water, all these different aspects that changed throughout these more recent years after World War II made mortality decline and then pushed uh, and make life expectancy increase throughout the world. And this is uh, just an example of increases in life expectancy 
in this case, only for more developed countries, in this example, for Japan, female in orange, Japanese male in red, US female, US male in light, light green, US female and, and darker green, US male. And then Denmark female, light yellow and this darker yellow or let's say light brown for, for Denmark male. For all of them, we see that same pattern of mortality by, by sex. Women having higher chances of living more than men across all these years. So this data here goes from a little before 1935 until 2010. And this is the average number of years that we expected people to live in those countries, taking into account mortality rates in those countries in these specific years. So in Japan, women living longer than men, in Denmark, and also in the US. But all of them increasing over time, both men and women in these three countries. And what you start to see too, and this is more clear here for the US, is that differentials between men and women start to get smaller. So the improves in life expectancy in more recent years start to be faster for men than, the, than for women. Women still live longer, but the differentials start to narrow, okay? Third point, fertility below replacement level. The period of most rapid population growth is already passed. Since its peak in 1965 and 1970, the growth rate has declined, falling roughly by half in 40 years as women have had fewer children. So the growth rate dropped from little over 2% per year. The population was increasing 2% per year. And now it's uh, growing around 1.2% per year. So it dropped a lot. So, and why it dropped a lot in these recent decades? In these recent decades, because of fertility decline women having fewer children, then the overall population growth rate declined a lot in these more recent decades, okay? And more, uh, the global fertility rate has dropped from five children per woman on average back in the 1950s to roughly uh, 2.5 children per woman in more recent years. That's this um, orange line or, or light red line here, okay? And the average woman in developing countries outside of China now has three children. So less developed countries excluding China, they had on average six children back in the 1950s, and now on average, they have around three children. So the levels of fertility is still vary a lot across countries. The yellow here being more developed countries and see how more developed countries on average, they have a fertility below the replacement level, below 2.1. So couples are not even replacing themselves. That's a sign that you have a decline in population in more developed countries as a whole. In more developed, in less developed countries, not considered China here because China drives a lot of these rates, bias these rates, declines a lot, but still on average three children per woman. And the overall rates for the whole world around 2.5. So the re below replacement level, we are saying that couples they are having on average fewer children to replace themselves. Whenever we are talking about replacement of a specific generation of parents by a generation of children, we usually take into account women. 
So it's the woman being replaced by daughters because they are the ones who will give birth. So what in order to be above the replacement level, women replacing themselves by daughters that will reproduce in the future, we want them to have at least one daughter that will reach the age of 49, which is the end of the reproductive ages. But a lot of these daughters, they will die before reaching 49 years of age. That's why they should have a little more than one. And this overall number, whenever you're talking about uh, replacement fertility, we talk about 2.1 children per woman. That's a really important concept in demography. Uh, does the replacement level account for mortality? For example, does a child born count as replacing their parents or do they need to be a certain age to count as replacement? The replacement level, when I'm saying the total fertility rate should be 2.1, I'm not considering mortality here. I'm, I'm exactly because I'm not considering mortality is that I'm saying that women, they should have more than two children on average, because that would replace the woman, the partner, and because those children might die before reaching 49 years of age, you give a little cushion to have a little more children exactly to replace them. There is a measure that we're gonna see in, um, in the fertility chapter. I'm talking so far about total fertility rate. That's this rate here that we saw in this previous graph. It's pretty much the overall number of children, men, boys, and girls per woman. If it's per woman, boys and girls, so we should have 2.1. There is another measure called gross reprodu uh, reproduction rate. The gross reproduction rate just counts the daughters that are being born. So if I counted the girls being born to mothers, so we should have a little more than one daughter in order to replace the mother. Whenever we talk about, we use the term fertility, we are counting boys and girls, children being born. Whenever we're talking about a uh, reproduction rate, we are talking about daughters. And we're gonna more, go in more detail in the fertility chapter. The gross reproduction rate takes into account the number of daughters to mothers. And then we can go a, a step further that goes into your question. We count only daughters that are being born to mothers. And we also apply the possible factor on, of mortality to these daughters. Some of these daughters will not reach 49 years of age, or some of these mothers will not reach 49 years of age in order to reproduce and have these daughters, right? So then in that measure that takes into account that counts only the daughters and do take into account that some of these women will not reach 49 years of age is called the net reproduction rate, NRR. The net reproduction rate takes into account only daughters replacing mothers and does take into account mortality, which goes in to answer specifically your question, okay? But exactly because total fertility rate does not take into account mortality, that's why we put it a little bit above 2.1. But the net reproduction rate, which takes into account only daughters being born to mothers and does take into account mortality, what we want net reproduction rate to be is equal to one. Because that would mean that one woman would have an average one daughter and that daughter would reach the reproductive, the reproductive ages until the end. Okay? Is that clear, Amanda? The idea is that we have a lot of different measures in, in demography that try to take into account these different factors. The, the, the indicator that takes into account mortality when measuring replacement level is the net reproduction rate, as we're gonna see in detail 
on the chapter about fertility. I'm gonna show you how to estimate it as well, how to calculate it with real data. Another change that we have been experiencing across uh, these last decades in the world is the fact that some countries still, they have a preference for, for boys being born instead of baby girls. And here in this uh, graph, we see India as a whole increase in the sex ratios at birth reaching levels above the 105. And remember 105 here is usually that uh, the biological normal for sex ratios at birth. On average, we would expect 105 baby boys being born for every 100 baby girls. But China, South Korea, and this specific area in India, Northwest India, they have much higher levels, reaching levels above 120 boys being born for every 100 girls in this specific year, in this specific country. In South Korea, you had um, more um, preference for boys in recent years, but then it has been dropping in this last, in, more, in even more recent years, okay? So, but then this causes a lot of changes in the sex composition of the population. So even with the one child policy in China, as we were talking before, women were having on average around two children throughout their, their reproductive ages. But then uh, they have this preference for boys causing the sex ratio to be so much higher than 105 boys per girls. So even with them having a total fertility rate of around two, that still they had the preference for boys that caused the sex ratios at birth to be so high, right? So biolo the biological normal level of sex ratio at birth is around 105 males for every 100 females, as I mentioned before. Several societies have much higher sex ratios at birth due to rapid fertility transition and cultural preferences for sons. And these countries now start to have available technology, pretty much ultrasound to determine the, the, the sex of the baby or the, fed, the, the fetus. If some women who don't want to have or have preference for sons, they perform an abortion when they realize that they are not uh, pregnant with a boy. And that makes the sex ratio at birth to increase a lot in these countries. And here to kind of like going into what Patrick was asking before. This is the oscillation of total fertility rate in China from 1950 to 2010. So after the implementation of the one child policy, you see that the fertility decline, the fertility rates, the total fertility rates were already declining in China even before the implementation of the one child policy. And then with the implementation of the one child policy, it kept going down. But see, even with one child policy, it's still above one. Here I would say like around 1.5. But for several years in the 90s, around two. And now in more recent years, with the relaxation of the one child policy, now families can have two children, the children would have access to government health services, education, uh, like public schools and everything. Even with that relaxation of the one child policy, these rates have not been going up, which shows that's not just the one child policy that makes fertility decline, but also economic development, as we saw even in years prior to the one child policy in China. Nineteen eighty-two. Oh, here. The question is like, even with the implementation of the one-child policy at the end of the seventies, how the rate still goes up in nineteen eighty-two. 
these numbers might have some measurement errors as well, right? So that's why you see some of these oscillations here. You see some oscillations here that's not just related to historical factors. See, you had like a, a huge. Uh, exactly. The, the, the great big uh, leap forward that caused a lot of like economic losses in the country, a lot of deaths in the country and people being more in poverty, they also tend to have fewer children. But from one country to the other, sorry, from one year to the other, you might see some oscillations that are not really well understood here. But the overall, what you have to see is the overall trends of declining, but not declining as much below two children per woman, right? But I understand your point that this uh, fertility here is not well explained, with the implementation of the one child policy some years before, right? And it's pretty much, uh, could be exactly after the one child policy being implemented, couples just said, oh, let's just have kids right away while the government is not really looking after us, or this could be error of the data. But overall, what you see is a little decline after the one child policy with little variations over time, right? But you might see these variations and these kind of variations, you see a lot really clear in migration because migration rates, they are really rare to happen. So you see some oscillations that are hard to explain with what was going on in that specific country, but it usually is related to measurement errors. Cool. So because of this one child policy that was implemented in China, and then because of this cultural preferences of couples for having sons, that created, that generated really high levels of sex ratios at birth. Exactly, prenatal, uh, prenatal sex identification via ultrasound made people perform abortion if they were pregnant with girls. So what does it mean? What's the result of these really high sex ratios at birth? What we want to understand is how that reproductive behavior that happened in the 80s and 90s, how will that affect the society in China for the next years? So between 1983 and 2010, over 41 million extra boys were born than girls. So 41 million more boys than girls. And this number is a larger number of bachelors in China than the total population in, in California in 2010 and in Texas. The total population in California in 2010 was 37 million people. In Texas was 25. In China, you had 41 million more boys than girls between 1983 and 2010. So you always hear on the news and there are several articles being published there that show how that affects the daily life of people in China. It's interesting, another day I was reading an article, I think it was in the New York Times, showing how in some street markets, they have some signs in which men they put like some advertisements about themselves. Oh, I have good level of education. I have a good job. I have a house, I have a car. I'm a good person to, to be married with. It's pretty much a marriage market going on in China. So there is a lot of this competition among men, single men trying to marry the fewer women who are available in the country around their same ages, exactly because of the high levels of sex ratios at birth. And that also causes a lot of Chinese men to look for brides outside of China in surrounding countries. So that changes the whole logic of how they plan their future and how the society organizes. Exactly because of this uh, policy being implemented, the one child policy. People also wanted to have less children because of economic development and the cultural uh, preferences for sons in China made people want to have 
more sons, sex ratio at birth increased so much, and that changes the daily life of these people in the country, right? What might happen if boys don't marry? And then in the textbook, uh, the authors, they, they, they talk about possible things that can happen in the future. Most men unable to fight sex partners will be poor, uneducated, unemployment, and migrate from rural to urban areas. Usually married people, they have better socioeconomic uh, status, better level of education across all the world. And in China, there is a system called Hukou system that is discussed in, in the migration chapter of the textbook, that people, they have to get a permit from the federal government to move from rural to urban areas. If they don't get this permit and they still migrate from rural to urban areas, and that happens a lot, a lot of people migrate into urban areas, even without the, the government permit, they move, but they won't have access to health, public health services. They don't have access to education for their children, so their children, they leave them behind in rural areas with all their family members. And men who migrate to urban areas, they will also uh, not be allowed to work in the formal labor market. So they will work in the informal labor market. The informal labor market pays less money to them, right? And some likely consequences is an increase in crime, violence, prostitution, increasing of sexually transmitted diseases, mainly among unmarried men, and unprecedented spread of HIV. So that's a huge concern going on in China. And the government now has been taking some actions uh, related to this issue. And then in the textbook, it discusses, for example, we, whenever we talk about HIV AIDS, we hear more the cases of sub-Saharan African countries. In 2013, in sub-Saharan African countries, 24.7 million adults were infected with HIV. This was almost 71% of adult infections all over the world. So that's really concentrated in this area. In 2010, around 1.2 million people died from AIDS, from AIDS in these countries. 1.9 million people became infected with HIV in this specific year. Here is up to 2013, almost 25 million adults infected with HIV. Only in 2010, you had these numbers. China could equal or exceed these numbers by now up to 2030. So because of the big population in China and all these issues of unmarried men and prostitution and everything, you start to see an increase in HIV AIDS and the country is beginning to take seriously the issue of HIV AIDS as a possible epidemic in the country. All related to reproductive behavior, son preference, high, higher sex ratios at birth. So simple measure of number of boys divided by the number of girls in a specific country in a specific year, we see the trends of them going up as the, the uh, graph that we saw before causes all these different aspects, all these changes in this specific society. So that's demography affecting our daily life. And the fifth aspect of changes that we have been observing is the population getting older. And here using the same scale in the horizontal axis of population in Edens, on the left side, we have the population in developing countries. It's still, a lot of people in younger ages, below the ages of 25, in relation to people in older age groups. And in developed countries, overall, the population is smaller in developed countries. We have more people in developing countries, as we saw in the first graph of this of these slides here, of this lecture. And also you see in developed countries because of fertility decline being more pronounced, the overall number of younger uh, people 
it's smaller than people in labor ages, both for men and for women. So 43% of the population less than, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, 43% of the population is below the age of 15 years of age. So it's a lot of people. And in Europe, only 16% instead of 43%. So many more younger or children below the age of 15 in Sub-Saharan Africa than in Europe. And also in Sub-Saharan Africa, only 3% of the people are at least 65 years old. And in Europe, already 16%, based on data from 2010. Just to show that you have a lot of variation in terms of age structure across countries in the world. You wanna add something? I don't know if I understand. So the developed countries is pretty much US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea. So those countries are considered developed countries. And those countries overall, the population, the overall population is really small compared to developing countries. The overall size of the population in developed countries, if you put them all together, is much higher. Let's just go back. Let's just go back to a graph that I showed, this one here. This graph shows the same thing. More developed countries nowadays have just 1 billion people. All that are expected to have only 1 billion people by 2050. All other countries, the developing countries, together are expected to have 8.3 billion people. So the number of people living outside the developed countries are 8.3 expected to be in 2050. In more developed countries, only 1 billion. That's why Hans Rosling in that paper, in that, in that video that is available in our website, he said, oh, I came up with a better um, categorization of countries. Instead of having more developed countries, other less developed countries, the least developed countries, because this population in developed countries is so small, one, okay, let's call them developed countries. And all these other ones here are simply the world. Kind of a joke to say that actually, whenever we make the separation of developed countries on one side and developing countries on the other side, in our brain, we kind of think, oh, the size of their population might be similar. No, the overall population in developed countries, it's really small. Only 1 billion expected by 2050 and 8.3 billion expected outside of those countries. And this information here from one specific year broken down by sex and age is exactly this graph, right? Does it answer your question? Cool. And this is another way to see population getting older. That's the percent of population aged at least 60 years uh, in the world, in more developed region, in less developed regions. In terms of percentage, it has been increasing over time for everyone, for the world is increasing in the uh, green columns, in the purple columns going up as well. And the less developed regions, it took a while to start to increase, but then it's also increasing over time. And, uh, but you still see that in more developed regions, more than 30% of the population have at least, are at least 60 years old. And in less developed regions, it's lower, but it increased and it reached 20% of people who are at least 60 years old. Right. Trying to understand all these changes that happen over time in terms of decline 
infertility and mortality. Demographers try to understand the similarities of these changes over time across countries. And they came up with this demographic transition model. And also I include some videos in our course website uh, going on and, and explaining this in detail. And of course, in the course textbook, it discusses as well. In pre-industrialized societies, before the industrial revolution you had really high levels of birth and death rates right so you had the birth rate really high and death rates really high as well in some cases you had birth rates higher than death rates in some cases the opposite but really high levels of birth and death rates so the population did not increase as much in overall size. After industrialization, modernization, you start to have some improvements in health habits. You have some improvements in provision of treated water, sewer system, and all that in specific countries. You start to see a huge decline in death rates. But the behavior of people of having a lot of children five, six children on average, depending on the country, continues. People start to live in a society in which their children live longer, so mortality declines, but the fertility rate or the birth rate don't decline as fast. So what happens? The difference between the overall number of people being born and dying, it's really big. The number of, no, of overall people being born in a specific country in a specific year minus the overall number of people dying in a specific country in a specific year gives us the natural increase of that country. Number of births minus the number of deaths in a specific country in a specific year. If births is much higher than deaths, you have a natural increase. And in this case, the natural increase is really, really big because mortality declines a lot, basic health measures. The mortality decline benefits at the beginning here in this specific case, exactly children. Children start reaching the ages of one and five and 15 years of age with higher chances because of basic changes in health habits, diet, hydration, everything to children more hygiene as well. And after a specific time, families start to realize, hey, I don't have to have eight children, seven, six children, in order for two to survive until older ages. And by the way, it's expensive if all of them reach older ages to provide education and everything else, food, housing, so you start to see a decline in fertility. So fertility starts to decline. And in this case here, the overall number of births minus the number of deaths is still high, but it starts to be smaller. So the population growth starts to ease off. So it doesn't, the population doesn't increase as much. And in more developed countries, the ones in which women are having on average less than two children. And in some cases, the overall number of births is even lower than the overall number of deaths. So you might have uh, a negative population uh, growth in those countries. So this, that's the phase of incipient decline. In the course website, the authors kind of divide this demographic transition, these four stages. And usually that's the four stages that we see in the literature. Stage one is pre-industrialization um, time. Stage two, the transitional industrialization modernization stage. Stage three, when fertility starts to decline. And stage four, when some more advanced countries start to see actually lower numbers of people born being born and then dying. 
But I like this graph here as well from that same website that I showed you before, Our World and Data. And they divide it in, four, in five stages. They pretty much divide the previous third stage here into three and four, right? But that's the, main, the same idea. High birth rates, high death rates, number of births really high, deaths really, really high. The population does increase as much. Stable or slow increase. I like this graph exactly because it includes here the population. The, the population increasing or decreasing in more recent years, which is related to the number of the, the birth rate minus the death rate. Death rate starts to fall really fast and birth rate stays really high. This number minus this number, natural increase is really strong. And then you start to see a very rapid increase in overall population size. And then afterwards, you start to see birth rates falling, kind of mirroring the fall of mortality rates. Then the natural increase, birth minus death, starts to uh, slow down. And then the birth rate starts to, uh, to reach really low levels. And the overall number of births minus the number of deaths, still it's more births than deaths. The population is still increasing, but in a slower rate than it was here. So it was really inclined here and starts to slow down. And in more recent years in more developed countries, you start to see cases even of overall number of births lower than the overall number of deaths. And then you see you expect to see a decline in, in population size, right? Within this, this discussion, you don't really have to, to memorize this, this, um, this formula here. It's just good for us to think, when population is growing here so much, if population keeps growing this really, really rapid rate. How many years would it take for the population to double in size if population keeps increasing so rapid like that? So the demographers came up with this uh, measure called the doubling times. The doubling time, what is the doubling time? It's the time it will take a population to double at a given growth rate if the exponential model were exactly true. What is the exponential model here? I have a specific population at the beginning of the period. K0 is the population at the beginning of the period. And I have a population at the end of the period. Let's say they have a population 2000. How much do I expect the population to be in 2010 if in these 10 years, what is the T? The time between 2000 and 2010, the beginning and the end of the period. How much the, uh, the population 2010 would be if I have a population in 2000 equals to 100 million people, I'm talking about 10 years from now until the future. Let's say that I have a population growth rate of 2% per year. So I have 2% per year, 10 years, initial population of 100,000 million, 100 uh, million people. How much would be the population 10 years from now? So that's what this formula is calculating. This is called, this formula here is the exponential model in which I have the population at the beginning of the period, the growth rate that I, that I have right now, the growth rate is calculated based on the difference between the birth and death rate. And the time from now until the future that I expect this, that I want to know the size of this population. In this specific question here, I'm trying to ask, let's say that I have a specific population now in 2000. If I have this specific growth rate here, 
how long time would it take for the population to double in time? So this population here would be two times the population at the beginning of the period. So the population at the end of the period would be two times the population at the beginning of the period. So two K zero equals the exponential of the growth rate. And then the time that it would take for the population to double from this size here to this size. And I just put the, the, the is each one of the members of this formula in specific size to calculate the, the time that it would take to double. So in this case here, I just keep two here. I cancel K zero with K zero in both sides because they are both multiplying on the left and on the right. So I have two equals the exponential of the growth rate times the time to double. If I take the log of two, I have log of two on the left. The log of the exponential just makes it the growth rate times this time to double. And then finally, I just transfer this R that's multiplying on this side, dividing to the other side. So this form is kind of simple. How much is the log of two? That's a constant. It's around 0.6931, or if you want to think it's 0.7, right? Let's say that a specific country is growing at a rate of 10%, the R is 10%. How many years would it take for that population to grow, to be the double of the size that it is now? How do you calculate that? So the R is 10%. In proportion terms, that's 0.01. So you just get 0.6931 divided by 0 0.01, 69 years, right? If a population is increasing 1% in size per year, it will take that population 69 years to double in size. To simplify, you can just think that the log, is approx log of two is approximated 0.7. So it's easy to do that on your head. So you have 0.7 divided by 0 0.01, exactly 70 years. If the population is growing much faster, 2% per year, how much would it be? How many years would it take for that population to double in size? 0.7 divided by 0.02, 35 years, right? So it's a really simple measure that we have just by getting the overall number of births and that we get the measure of the population growth and we get the log of two divided by the population growth. Population growth, not in percentage, but the original rate. Just divide 0.7 by that rate. If a population is growing really, really fast, 7%, per year, how long, how many years would it take for that population to double in size? Did I say 10%? When I said the population is increasing 1% per year. So I'm just answering the, the, the quiz here. Wouldn't 10% be 0.1? Yes. 10% is 0.1, but I was talking about 1%. If I said 10%, I said it wrong, sorry. I don't know what I said. But what I said was like, if a population is increasing 1% per year, 1% is 0 0.01. I said, yeah, I don't know what I said, but I'm, I'm just explaining it again. If a population is increasing 1% per year, that's 0 0.01, 0 0.7, divided by 0 0.01, 70 years. If the population is increasing 2% per year, that's 
0.7 divided by 0 0.02. Would take only 35 years for the population to double in size. Let's get the example of, of Zach. The population really increasing really, really fast, 10% per year. Will be 0 0.7 divided by 0 0.1, seven years only. In seven years only, I would be able to double the population if that population is increasing by 10% per year, right? Of course, there is variation in fertility and mortality over time, but it's good for us to have this reference in order to see what we expect into the future. Let's say that the population is declining 2% per year or 1% per year. So the 0.7 divided by 0 0.01, but negative. This number would be negative 70. In that case, if it's negative, we would be saying that the population would take 70 years to have in size, right? So that would be the having time. And just some examples here with real data, not these examples that I gave with more uh, fictional data here. With real data, the population 8,000 BC was only 5 million people in the world, was, uh, is, is estimated to be only 5 million people in the world. And 1 AD, it was around 20, 50 million people. So it increased from five to 250 million people. So increasing from 5 million to 250 million in all these years, the growth rate was really low because mortality was really high. So the growth rate was 0 0.000489. So if I just take the log of two and divide it by this, if the population was still increasing over time, but in really low levels, this population would take 1,417 years to, in, to double in size, to reach 10 million people. Here it declined from 250 to 200 million people. So this is saying if the population kept declining this pace, it would take 1,858,000 1, years, 1,858 years for the population to go from 250 million to 125. And what you start to see in more recent years is that the growth rate starts to increase a lot. The population increased from 2.5 billion to 4.0, to 4 billion in 75. Only 25 years, it increased from 2.6 billion to 4.1 billion. So the growth rate was almost of 2%. 0 0.02. This number divided by 0 0.02, in only 37 years, I would expect this population to increase from 2.6 billion to 5.2 billion people in the world. So that's a really simple way to measure how the growth rate could affect the overall size of the population. And here it's kind of like similar to the, the, the first graph that I just went back now in the, what's your name? Mena. Mena, uh, Mena asked when she asked the question about the composition of the, the world population by developing developed countries. I went back to that graph. That's the similar as this, thing, this, this table here. This is, we are just showing how, um, which years the world uh, reached increased by 1 billion people, how was the annual growth rate and the overall annual increases in millions. So it was in million back in the 70s and 80s, it was really high and then it starts to decline, oscillates a little bit and goes down again, right? And we are expected to reach 8 billion by 2024, 9 billion 2040, and 10 billion in 2061. Another way to show the same data, population increasing 
1 billion over time. How here in the 70s and 80s, it increased really fast. And then in more recent years, starts to, the curve starts to um, not be so steep anymore. Related to the population uh, uh, increases, we have population growth rates. The highest levels of population growth rates were exactly in the 60s and 70s, and now it's projected to keep going down. These are the projections of the United Nations. And the United Nations has these different projections, the medium projection, the high projection, the low projection. Usually they vary a little bit. They create different scenarios based on what they expect that the fertility will be. So if the fertility keeps declining, but in a more steady pace, fertility declines a lot and fertility goes back up. So these are the different projections of the UN for the next years. But again, reaching around 11 billion people by 2100. And you see that these numbers, they tend to be around similar levels. The medial variant here in this graph showed in the textbook, by 21, also around, expected to have around 11 billion people in the world. And then the, the projections show that we we're gonna have more stable population size because the fertility starts to decline all over the countries. But these are other scenarios kind of showing that if you keep having a constant fertility that doesn't decline, the population would explode. But we know that in less developed countries, fertility is also declining. These tables here, these next two tables, I made them by watching this video of Hans Rosling, the facts about population that's available in our course website. And the direct link is here. The, the, the video is available in our, in our course website. And usually he mentions that people are too worried about the population increasing a lot. People are just too worried about the population size itself. But what they don't realize is, okay, the population is still increasing over time, but it will tend to stabilize around 11 billion people by 2100. But it's interesting, related to what Manu said, how developed countries have much smaller population overall than developing countries. Back in 2013, you had 1 billion people in the American continent, including North, Central, and South, 1 billion in Europe, 1 billion in Africa, 4 billion in Asia, 7 billion in, in total. By 2050, we expected to see the African population to double in size and the Asian population to increase by another billion. And then we would reach 9 billion. And then by 2100, again, the African population should double in size because fertility is still high in, in Africa. But then after this, we expect the fertility to slow down in Africa. And here fertility already slows down in Asia. So the population would tend to be more stable. When fertility gets into the levels of, on average, two children per woman, then you start to see more stable projections of the population. So the issue that we should think is not the overall size of the population itself, because what demographers have been shown is that the population size in the world, we might reach this peak of 11 billion people by 2100. We not go much higher than that. The problem is the geographic distribution. Africa, you have a population four times bigger in this around 90 years, 90 years between 2013 and 2100. And that's where we might need a lot of policy being implemented, right? This population is not increasing as much. Asia, okay, one billion, but then afterwards tends to stabilize. Africa tends to stabilize after this, but that's a huge increase from one to two to four. And again, just listening to his presentation, to his video, 
I made this other table here. This previous table is by continent. This table here is by age group. And he's pretty much saying, these people here in younger ages, you get older, mortality is declining, so people survive into older ages to the next decades, survive to the next ages. And it, you don't add too many people. The fact is that these people here, when they reach older ages, these people here are the ones having these children. Two children per woman, they're just replacing themselves. These ones get older, they have children, they are their children right here. These ones get older, have children, those are their children here. But of course, mortality will keep to decline and then you also expect to have more people in older ages, but the overall distribution by age in the country, this is the age structure of the world by 2100 is expected to be like this and is not expected to change as much anymore. So that's a distribution by continents and that's a distribution by age. We have a lot of models, all these discussions and everything, but overall, that's what we're expecting for these next decades. Cool? So I will just finish this slide in the next class and start the chapter related to US population trends, the next chapter. So thank you very much. I will post the quiz in these next few hours and I will send an email whenever it's available. And I will also change the time that it finishes, give you some extra time. Thank you very much. And I see you on Thursday.